you want to join me over there, I encourage you to do so. First John chapter number two, beginning at verse number three. We're going to read just a few verses together and launch the, the foundation for our lesson this morning. But it says in that place, beginning at verse number three, it says, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. There's a whole lot of people in this world that claim Jesus, but they aren't doing what he told them to do. And I think it's interesting how it's so plain right here. We can't hardly mistake it. Verse number four says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfect, uh, perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. We have an opportunity for, to consider this particular passage and how it really relates to our lives and how it relates to, the, to what we're striving to do. Because what we have here set before us is an example. An example that is drawn up as our example, the premier example, the number one example that we must follow if we're going to achieve the things that we're looking for. I know that according to the Scriptures, if I don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if I don't stand there on the day of judgment with Jesus saying He's one of mine, then I'm not going to make it to heaven. And the way to make it to heaven is to keep His commandments. The way to keep His commandments is to walk as He walked. But you know, it's far easier to claim to be a Christian than it is to actually be a Christian. There's just a whole lot of people out there that, that just are absolutely convinced in doing whatever they're doing or doing nothing. Well, I'm a Christian. It's interesting that we claim such things. Did you know that uh, there's, there's such a... And I don't even know if it's uh, legitimately a crime anymore. Somebody can correct me later on this. But it's called stealing honor. If you walk around with, with army medals on, uh, claiming to be someone who served in the military, or whatever, for, whatever branch it might be, uh, you, actually you get in trouble for that. And, and that, what that means is you're saying that you're something that you're not. And if you bring it all the way down to even, even simple things, there's individuals that have found their way into employment and such by writing down that they're an Eagle Scout on, uh, on their resume. If you're not, that's... It's not right. And so we come along and we go, well, that's wrong to steal honor. It's wrong to do that. But how many people just say, well, I'm a Christian when they're back stealing that particular honor? Many want eternal hope. Uh, why wouldn't you? I mean, if, if you come to the basic understanding, the most basic understanding is that there is a heaven and there is a hell. And that you have to prepare yourself to get to heaven. I, I, why would anyone ever choose the other? Right. So everyone wants the eternal hope of a child of God, but they don't want the responsibilities of a child of God. The requirements of all who claim Christ is to walk as he walked. So that's what we're set out to find this morning. The confidence of this particular goal is that I don't have to guess. I don't have to just run back to secular history and look up and say, well, what did so-and-so say about it or anything else like that? I have this inspired record from God that leads me to the understanding of how Jesus walked, every step that he took. We don't have to wonder about what he did. We have the example recorded for us, and we can carefully study it, and we can follow it if we choose to do so. According to uh, Luke, as he wrote the book of Acts, and that's not a typo up there, he spoke about the book of Luke in the first verse of the book of Acts. He says, the things that I recorded before for you, O Theophilus, the things that Jesus both began to do and to teach teaching to do and you can flip flop those words any way you want Jesus was consistent with the things that he did and the things that he taught first Peter chapter 2 verse number 21 says for to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow his steps it's kind of interesting how it it comes along and I know that you at the end of that particular verse is more generic like a congregation or a group of Christians but own that verse Jesus left you an example that you should follow his steps that's what we need to see. And we look at it that way. We can know how Jesus walked in this life. It's up to us to, to follow that, to do exactly the same. So let's discover this. Let's think about these things and these three points together. Jesus always put God first. 
If there was ever a challenge that you could say is a, is a modern challenge, I suppose we're busier than people of humankind have ever been. I, I, don't, I don't know any other way that we could have been busier. Now, I'm not saying we're more productive. I'm not saying we're accomplishing more. I'm just saying we're busy with all sorts of things. Our minds are always going 100 miles an hour each every direction there is. And, you know, that's the thing. But Jesus always put God first. And we'll come along and say, well, I put God first. Do you always put God first? Because there's a difference in those statements. You think about it this way. Jesus understood the importance of doing the work of God and from the very earliest insight to his life. Now, we know about the birth record. You know, Jesus was born in Bethlehem and those things that all that happened has surrounded that. We get that. But the very first insight to his childhood was in Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 2, at the end of that chapter, we find Jesus is, well, inadvertently or accidentally left behind. And the, the entourage that he came with started leaving and heading home. And uh, they were quite a ways away. And they, well, where is Jesus? You know, where is he? And they returned to the city. And there he was in the temple discussing, asking questions, answering questions. Uh, and he was 12 years old. Even then, he said, I must be about my father's business. Jesus put a priority on the will of God, seeking God first, even then. Now, Jesus did not begin his ministry then. He went home with his, with his earthly parents, as it were. And so he was subject to them as he should be, as a good child should be. Now, he continued throughout his life, however, to put God first. And this is what we have in the record. Jesus said in John chapter 4, verse number 34, and this particular statement always speaks to me, really speaks to my heart, because it's a dangerous thing to get between me and my fork. But, you know, to say that something equates food, something equates food, what does food do? Food is what sustains us. Food is what gives us the energy to, to go forward. What is it that it allows us to stay alive? And think about how Jesus put this. He, he didn't refuse food. There's several times throughout the scriptures where Jesus ate actual food, even after he was resurrected. He ate fish and honey, uh, as it were, as we know. But look what he said. John 4, verse 34. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. It's just that essential. The will of God is as essential to him as food to sustain his life and to finish his work. So it's not just when it's convenient, I'll have God with priority, but it is to finish his work, to do it, everything that's expected of me. That's what Jesus said. And he did this all the way to the end. In John chapter 17, verse number four, Jesus said, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you have given me to do. So Jesus did not fail to put God first all the way through. He accomplished the things that God set out before him. Philippians chapter two, verse number five says, and being found in appearance of, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. I often wonder what is our breaking point? What is the point where we stop progressing in our faith and perhaps even abandon our faith. Because when we're looking at a lesson where we're following Jesus and walking in His footsteps, and I say that Jesus put God's will first, and He obeyed Him, and He knew that there was work for Him to do, and He did the work, and we can all kind of sit back and go, well, that's good, and I think I would do that too. I think I would be just like that too, and, and I should be. And then all of a sudden we realize that His particular work was to go to the cross, and die that horrible death? What was, what's our breaking point where we stop following Jesus? Now, God did not ask us to go to the cross. And it wouldn't benefit your, your eternal soul anyway. You know, it's not like we can go to the cross and pay for our own sins. It's not how it works. But we know that Jesus put God first with no question, no reservation. There's no limit. It's what does the Father expect? That is what I will do, even to the point of death. So all too often, we fail to focus. We fail to put that priority on, on God and His will. We get our priorities all mixed up. In Luke chapter number 8, maybe that, that's a familiar chapter, but the parable of the sower, 
the sower went out and sowed seed and seed fell on the wayside and seed fell among the thorns and fell on the, the rocky soil and, the, and also on the good soil. And we know that there was a description of this, this soil that was growing something else. Something else was trying to compete with its growth. And that was the thorns, the cares of the world. So if we're trying to grow God's will and trying to grow this worldly life as well, the competition will be on. And according to God, who knows better than we know, the world will win. See, that's the problem with the thorns and the cares of the world. The world will win. We must put a priority on God even when it comes to family. This is one of the challenges. I want you to turn to this particular passage because it's important for us to really let this one sink in. We, this, this area of the country, which I am privileged to live in, I love it here, I really do. Uh, and, I, and I say that because I am a, a foreigner, you know? I'm one of those uh, people that moved in. And I don't mean from Canada, I mean I moved in from outside of Arkansas. Anyway, so uh, I moved into this area, and I love this area, but this area is strong with family. It's strong with family. And, and it, there's, not, there's, there's several areas, there's several little pockets of, of the, our country where you'll have great-great-grandparents and great-grandparents and grandparents and parents, and, you know, and, and the families are growing that way, and they're all kind of huddled together like that. And so we get this point where this family is strong. And family is certain. And family becomes the priority over God. Oh, see, that's where we cross the line. I want you to look at what Jesus said over here in in Matthew chapter number 10. I know you're turning over there and you're already there waiting on me to show up, but I will get there in just a moment. Matthew chapter number 10. And take a look there with me. And I know it's uh, verse number 37 up there on the board. But I want you to look at verse number 34 what Jesus said, and this is kind of interesting because we are, we are to walk as Jesus walked, follow his example, but look what it says. Do not think I came to bring peace on earth. That, isn't that strange? Did that sound like the Jesus most people describe? Jesus himself saying, do not think I came to bring peace on earth. Look what it says. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother, or against her mother, excuse me, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. What, what's intriguing about this is Jesus didn't come to stir up trouble. But Jesus came bringing a message. A message that has ultimate importance. A message that not everyone will accept, but those who accept it must then stand with it. Even at the cost of family. That's the importance of this message. It's not that we get to the day of judgment and God says, oh, uh, I've been looking for you. I've been waiting for you to show up. Uh, You've got a really strong family. I'm glad you put them first. I think we want those exceptions. This is not what Jesus is revealing to us. Look what it says. A man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He didn't say don't love your parents. He didn't say don't love your children. He said don't love them more than you love me. Don't put them first. God comes first. It says he who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So we talk about family. But you know who is an important person in my family? Me. Do you know that? I'm an important person in my family. To me, family includes me. Did you notice the last part? Because it talks about son and uh, son and uh, son and our children and parents. I'll try to say it that way. Children and parents, you know, all of that. He talks about those relationships, but then he talks about he who loses his life for my sake. I'm involved in that, too. I've got to step aside from the things that I want if I'm going to do God's will with priority. We must not put friends ahead of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 33 says that corrupt friends corrupt our morals. Our, our determined good behavior can be corrupted by friends. We must not put the world ahead of God. Matthew chapter 6, verse number 24 tells us to choose between God and the world. Now, if you turn over there in the New King James, I know it says the word mammon. And, and it's like, 
there is one of those impossible words that nobody uses anymore. The word mammon means worldliness. It means the corruptions of the world. And so why would there ever be a contest? Why would there ever be a contest where somebody is weighing out the corruptions of the world and God's way? Because we don't usually look at the worst stuff of the world when we start comparing notes. We look at what the world paints those things as. We look at the candy coating. You know, one of the things that my parents did when I was a child growing up was they would uh, get on these kicks for vitamins and strange things. Even for a while there, I couldn't swallow a, a capsule or pill or anything like that. I just had one of those phobia reactions as a little kid, you know. And so uh, she got, my mom got on this kick of giving us um, cod liver oil. Yeah, everybody knows about that, right? So my brother could swallow the little gel cap and he just, all right, moving on with my day. My mom would take a, a straight pin and poke the capsule and squirt it out into a spoon and give it to me. I learned how to swallow pills in a hurry. Now, that's not what I'm talking about. One of the things that they decided with a vitamin one time was this, it looked like an M&M. It looked just like an M&M. It actually had a thin candy coating on the outside, but the inside was made of carob, not chocolate. And it was full of vitamins, which I just want sugar, <laughs> you know. But the thing is, what I fell for was it looked like chocolate. And I couldn't wait to, oh, these are, that's way better than having the other, you know. So just let me have one of those. And the first time I tried one, it was like, I don't know. I don't know what horse food tastes like, but I would guess kind of like that, you know. Uh, but here's the thing, when I got, after the first one, I would take them every day and I would palm them. And on the way out of the house, on the way to school, I'd throw them in the snowbank on the edge of the driveway. And sometime around the middle of March that year, my mom, I, she came home, she goes, she got a handful of these half-melted carob vitamins. Uh, she says, be sure your sins will find you out. See, what happened with those things is they try to fool kids into thinking that they're candy. And they put a little thin candy coating on the outside of those vitamins. And that's what the world does to attract people. We don't talk about the corruptions of this world and go, oh, I want to get into the worst possible sin. We look at the candy coating and go, oh, that looks fun. That's what I want. That's what we need. We've got to put God first, not the world first. Nothing should be allowed to take God's place in our life. To walk as Jesus walked, we're going to need diligence, effort, energy, focus. Be diligent to present yourself. That's what we need to be in this life. That diligence in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 15 is the diligence of studying the Word of God. We need strength. Watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. 1 Corinthians 15, or 16, verse number 13. We have to have those things. That's what we need. Steadfastness, holding fast to the word of truth. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 14 to 16. When we look at what's required of us, for me to say, I'm a Christian, is easy. For me to live, I'm a Christian, it's going to need some diligence, some strength, and some steadfastness. We need to see this life as Jesus did, a temporary span in which we have the opportunity to seek our Creator and serve Him. This life is our opportunity, just as Jesus taught us to walk in this life for God. Well, Jesus also resisted temptation and sin. And it's important for us to do this. I think sometimes, uh, and as this point develops, this particular comment is going to make a little more sense. But one of the things that we do is we'll, we will use this justification. We will say something along the lines of, well, Jesus was perfect. He was. I'm never going to argue with that. Jesus was perfect. Now, why do we say that? Because what is it we always say? Well, I'm only human. I'm not perfect, you know. And so you put those two things together and all of a sudden you're justifying the fact that you're sinning. Instead of trying to be like Jesus and avoid sin and resist temptation. Let's consider these things. First Peter chapter one, verse number 22, Jesus speaks to us. He, sa he says, uh, it says of Jesus, he committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. That's Jesus. That's his description. So how did he avoid sin? Yeah, the simplest answer 
is by resisting temptation, not giving in to temptation. That's how he avoided sin. I can't disagree with that, but it's a little simplified. Some may assume that it was his divine power. I have absolute trust that God put 100% God and 100% human in the same package at the same time. I have no doubts in that whatsoever. That's who Jesus was. Emmanuel, God with us. And so some may assume that Jesus used his divine power to avoid temptation. And if I had divine power, I could avoid temptation. But I think that's a false conclusion. If we carefully examine the Gospels, and we're going to find four different ways that Jesus avoided temptations. And I want us to take note of these things because every one of these things only require your ability to say, that's what I'm going to do. Do not require divine power at all. In Matthew chapter number four, and you remember this particular instance, it's when uh, Jesus went out to the wilderness and he fasted 40 days and 40 nights and Satan came and tempted him. And in those temptations, what Jesus did to avoid giving into them was he quoted scripture. You don't need divine power or the power of deity to quote scriptures. You need a knowledge of the scriptures. We need to be reading the word of God so that we know how does that work in real life and functioning? You know, because Satan doesn't come and sit there beside me and say, hey, Sean, check this out. He doesn't do that. But in essence, if I know the will of God, if I have 2 Timothy 2.15 studied the will of God, then I'm going to know what things are right and what things are wrong. And that's the essence of what Andrew said in his class this morning. He did a great job with class. I always enjoy it. He, all, he said that we don't have every single thing in the Bible that's prohibited. God gives us a mind to reason these things. We are told and we understand what and the like means. And that was the example he used. It was a great point. But you know, here's the thing. I need to know enough scriptures that if I'm faced with a decision, is this right or this wrong? I know what the Bible says on it. And most of us do. And we can all improve. John chapter number six, verse number 15. Jesus was popular. There was a certain crowd that thought he was just amazing and they followed him like fans follow a rock singer or something like that. And so we have a situation where Jesus was going to be taken by force and made an earthly king. They were going to get him a throne and set him on it and he was going to take over. <clears throat> Jesus in that instance could have said, well, I could be really famous, <laughs> you know, I could I could talk to everybody in the whole world. Maybe this that maybe the, the the end result of being an influence to everybody will have, a, you know, be justified by me transgressing God's will and becoming a king on earth. And we all are thinking, no, what did Jesus do in that instance? He walked away. How many times? I'm not calling for a show of hands. How many times in your life have you found yourself ankle deep, head first into sin when you could have just walked away. Just walk away. Jesus taught us that. In Matthew chapter 26, verse number 39, it says he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed. Interesting. What was going on? The mob was coming to take him, to arrest him, to crucify him. They were, they were coming and his life was coming to its bitter, horrible end. And Jesus was aware of what was going to happen. But what did Jesus do in that moment? That moment where I absolutely believe, I absolutely believe because Jesus has as much freedom to choose for himself as I do, that Jesus could have, I don't know, what, what can we do in a twinkling of an eye? Could have ended all of this. Jesus could have ended this all instead of facing that death for us. But what did he do in that moment? When you are challenged by life and you're challenged by temptation, you're challenged by sin, stop and realign yourself with God in prayer. Get back into that groove where you're thinking about God. I think sometimes we want to avoid that altogether because we know it's sin. We know it's temptation over here and we're going to walk into it. And we're going to go 
you know, try the shallow end. Instead, we need to be running away and praying to God. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 13 and 14, Jesus has been arrested. He is standing on trial. As much as that trial could be, I think they call it a kangaroo court, right? False, accu uh, false accusers have been paid to speak against him. They're going to wait out a sentence before him. And what did Jesus do? Now, I challenged you earlier about walking away and how often that could have helped us. How many times have we found ourselves way deep into sin and it wouldn't have happened if we would have just... You see how that works? It takes a level of maturity, it takes a level of purpose, but I've already told you in the first point, it's going to take strength and diligence and steadfastness to walk as Jesus walked. Jesus quoted Scripture, He walked away, He prayed, and He kept silent. None of those things require a miracle. We can do those things. We can use all four of these to resist temptations in our life. Can we avoid sin? Well, we must not mistakenly believe that Romans 3.23 gives us a license to do it. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Doesn't mean you have to. It just means you do. That's what we do. Unfortunately, all of us fall into that. The reality is, all do sin, but it's not something that allows us to sin. It's not our permit to sin. There is a difference between do and must. All sin. All do sin. No, it doesn't say all must sin. We can use the same steps that Jesus used. I want you to get to the last point and let them be yours. Jesus made it home to heaven. I know it says went home to heaven, and, and I don't know. I kept going back and forth on it, and I guess I've just announced the fact that I changed that title of the point, but Jesus made it home to heaven. I want you to walk in His steps. God has revealed in His Word that if we're going to be His disciples, if we're going to be Christians, if we're going to be followers of Him, that we're going to walk in His steps. His steps not just lead us through this life, but lead us beyond this life to that place called heaven. Jesus made it to heaven. Follow Him. There's no mistaking where He is right now. The prayer before going to the cross, He said, I have glorified you on earth, and now, O Father, glorify me with Yourself. John chapter 17, verses 4 and 5. Where is God the Father? He's in heaven. Jesus is going to be lifted up and glorified. After His resurrection, John chapter 20, verse number 17, Mary, she comes there to the, that area where Jesus shows himself to be alive and she grabs a hold of him. And that's that it's not Jesus is not saying, don't hug me in this passage, but she grabbed a hold of him. And we don't really understand the, the, the tense of it all, but it's the idea that she's never letting go. She already lost him once. She's not going to lose him again. She's never going to let go. But look what Jesus said. Mary tried to prevent him from leaving. Jesus said, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Where is Jesus? He's with God the Father. That's where he's at. After the instructing of the apostles, Jesus there uh, in Jerusalem, but he told them to stay in Jerusalem. But they were in Bethany, just about two miles away from Jerusalem. And it says, now, as it came to uh, now it came to pass, while he blessed them, that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And so Jesus, we know, is in that place called heaven. He made it there. We need to follow him. Jesus spoke in John chapter 14, verse number 1 through 6, about a place that he's preparing for us, expecting our arrival. Do you get that? Jesus said, walk as I walked, follow me. And he went there. Where are we supposed to end up? There. So he's preparing a place for us. Terry and Martha had some friends come in this weekend. They're with them in Tuckerman because a lot of Terry's, uh, Terry's friends, a lot of them have been preachers and, and are preachers. And, and Dennis Tucker is still a preacher at Lilac Road Congregation in Litchfield, Kentucky. But he took the weekend off and he came down here to visit Terry and Martha. And... Uh, you know, what happened was they prepared a room for them. They, you know, they didn't just 
leave all the boxes in there from this remodeling and moving and everything else. They prepared a room for them, knowing that they were coming, expecting them to show up. They prepared a room for them. What is Jesus doing for you right now? In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you I go in, prepare a place for you. Jesus expects you to follow him there. Jesus is waiting. He's waiting at the right hand of God. He's waiting in that place that's ready for us. It's prepared for us. That's made for us. It's a place where we belong. The pathway that he le left for us leads all the way home to heaven. First Peter chapter 2, 21 to 23. If we go his way, which is the way, we're going to find that home that we seek. John chapter 14, verse number 6. The home prepared to be where Jesus is with him for eternity. Jesus has established the steps that lead us there. Let's follow those steps. Let's determine to walk as he walked all the way home. Is it possible to live like Jesus? It better be. It better be because if it's not, we are without hope. We have no hope of heaven whatsoever if it is impossible to live like Jesus lived. The expectations of God are perfect. God is never wrong. And when God says do it, you have to be capable of doing it. That's the conclusion that comforts me. It comforts me because I know that if God expects it of me, I can do it. Therefore, I want to make it home to heaven. By examining the pattern left by the Lord, we can become like Him. We can look at His example. We can see these particular points. We can get to work on them even now. Jesus set for us an example to put God's will first, to stand strong against the world's temptations, and to continue all the way home to heaven. Even now, the opportunity to begin following the example of Christ is yours. Come to Jesus, walk His way, seek His hope, obey the gospel, even now. He is the Son of God, but He expects you to believe that He died for you. He died for you to give you the hope that you have in this moment. This moment, whether you are ready or not, you are being made aware of the fact that there is hope for you to stand up and say, I've had enough of sin. I want to become a true Christian. I want to follow Christ. Confess Him as the Son of God. Determine to repent of those sins. Have those sins washed away in the water of baptism. Rise and walk in the newness of life and join us. We are striving to follow the steps of Jesus all the way home. Joining us will bring your strength and your commitment. Our encouragement. All of those things will work together and we can make it home. Every once in a while, even on this side of the water of baptism, after we have come up out of the water in the newness of life, we mess things up. But there is this incredibly special and exclusive privilege, an exclusive opportunity reserved for those in Christ that we don't have to go through the whole process of being baptized again and all of those things in order to have our sins taken away over here. We are told in the Scriptures, according to Acts chapter 8, that if we, can, that if we are willing to confess our sin to God, Pray to God and ask for forgiveness. He is willing to forgive us. Put that together with 1 John chapter 1, verse number 9. So this morning, if you're not yet a Christian, why not? We're talking about making it to heaven or not. So now is an opportunity to become a child of God and start following Jesus with us. And if you are a Christian and not living the way you should and haven't fixed it, why not? Fix it. Get back on the footsteps. Get back on the pathway back where you belong. If we can help you come to the Lord or back to the Lord, let us help you as we stand and sing.